Good evening. Um, here we are at Davis Media Access in Davis, California, and our program is On the Wire. My name is Mark Graham. I'm the host for this program. Our guest is Mr. Tom Bleese, and tonight we're going to be talking about the global energy revolution. So hold on to your seats. There's going to be a lot of interesting, fun information here. Tom, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Sure. My pleasure. Uh, I want to start out by showing our audience the book that you've just written. It was published last fall called Prescription for the Planet. And if we could cut to that slide, people will get a close-up view of this book. Um, now, this book, do you want to briefly tell us what's the uh, subject of your book, Tom? Well, essentially, the, um, the book describes three little-known technologies that uh, taken together and utilized in the way that's proposed in the book can actually lead the whole planet to a post-scarcity uh, situation where everyone on the planet would have ample, even abundant energy and uh, utilize the resources in such a way that um, the standard of living for everyone on the planet could be elevated without uh, depleting the resources. because. So many times people say, well, if, if everybody on the planet wanted to have the lifestyle of an American or a European, we'd need three or four Earths. There just simply aren't enough resources. Um, the reason that there aren't enough resources is because of the bad way we use the resources and just throw them away. Um, and using these technologies, we would be able to recycle virtually everything and provide all the energy that everyone needs. Wow. Now that sounds like a heck of a promise. A heck of a promise you've made to us. So I was thinking about electricity today. And I was thinking, to my understanding, here's the way it works. When I go to turn on the light switch, the lights come on. So the system works in some sense of the word. All right, we generate some air pollution, but that's, that's part of life. We've been doing it like this for a long time. As long as there's more, more coal in the ground, why don't we just keep mining it, and burning it to make electricity, and what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it is global warming, for starters, and, and not just global warming. I mean, there are some people that don't believe in global warming, um, although I, I believe that the, the proof is almost irrefutable. I think uh, slide two would probably uh, give some idea of, of the proof behind global warming. We are going to um, get to that soon. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even if you don't believe in global warming, that it's a problem, uh, it's, it's a fact that uh, there's a tremendous amount of pollution generated by coal. There's uh, about oh, $160 billion a year is lost just because of coal pollution, deaths, uh, premature deaths due to coal. Uh, that's just in the United States. China is way worse than the United States. Um, and so if you, if you, don't believe in global warming, fine, but if you like clean air, that's a perfectly good reason to pursue the policies in this book and to leave the coal in the ground. Mm -hmm. All right, um, smokestacks. <clears throat> Our second slide gives us one little shot of some smokestacks uh, at a coal-fired energy plant. And according to the notes I've got here, it looks like there are about 500 coal-fired power plants in the United States. That's a huge amount. I mean, it averages out, what, to 10 per state, and over 100 more that are owned by industry, so we're up to 600. I th seem to remember hearing that in China they're building one more new coal power plant every week. Is that it? Uh, at least one a week. At some, least one Some a week. weeks they open two. Um, China has such a tremendous problem with pollution now. Seven of the 10 most polluted cities in the world are located in China. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pollution from China mingles with the pollution from the rest of Southeast Asia to form a brown cloud called the Asian brown cloud by some people mm -hmm. that stretches from Afghanistan to Japan. Um, and a lot of that pollution ends up coming all the way across the Pacific and, and drops in the United States. Uh, the fact is that no matter what we do in the United States, we can't pretend that the issue of pollution or the issue of global warming is a United States issue. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't call it U.S. warming. <clears throat> There's a reason for that. Um, and so a lot of the times when people are talking about what are we going to do about global warming and energy, 
they have a very myopic view. They say, well, okay, <coughs> if we, and then they lay out some plan for what the United States has to do, but it wouldn't matter if the U.S. went to zero carbon emissions today. As long as we don't have China, India, and the rest of the world on board, we're in a world of hurt. So, uh, so we have to have solutions that actually are going to work as opposed to solutions that people dream might work mm -hmm. or technologies that somebody is supposed to invent sometime really quick in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we need uh, solutions that are going to be applicable to the entire planet, and that's what uh, Prescription for the Planet is all about. So we're, all right, we're aiming for the whole world to find a cleaner way to produce electricity. The whole shebang, not just a cleaner way, uh, an absolutely clean way, so that clean. our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the targets for you know the Kyoto Protocol and and son of Kyoto and grandson of Kyoto, uh, they call for a reduction of emissions for below 1990 levels, from around anywhere from 20 to 50 to even 80 uh, percent. What I'm aiming for is 100 mm -hmm. percent, and hopefully then also using. Um, our power systems to actually reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is so much higher than it was pre-industrial that uh, the danger is global warming is going to continue to happen because carbon dioxide is so persistent in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to not only stop it, we have to turn it around. And anybody that tells you that we should only get 50 percent or 70 percent or whatever, um, they're not getting us where we have to be. It, it seems that would just be um, accepting a plan where we continue to add the, to the problem, only slower. Yeah, a bit slower. But the thing is, we reach tipping points, and then and then it becomes a, a per self perpetuating cycle. Like mm -hmm. now, they're finding that the tundra is melting and releasing huge amounts of methane, which is 20 times worse as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. It doesn't last quite as long in the atmosphere. But once it breaks down in the atmosphere, it breaks down into carbon dioxide, which then lasts almost a thousand years. So um, unless we can both stop it and find a way to reverse it, we're probably in deep trouble. We're almost 100 parts per million. We're at about 380, 385 parts per billion or parts per million uh, carbon dioxide right now. Hmm. Pre-industrial was about 280. Wow. So, and uh, that's one of the reasons we're seeing our glaciers melting, our polar ice cap melting, and a lot of the problems associated with strange weather patterns. All right, so we're looking at a global problem and a global solution. Now, one other thing that happens with coal, recently there was a big spill near in Tennessee of coal ash, which I didn't really know about until I heard this. But apparently, after you burn the coal in a power plant, you end up with ash, and the good folks that run these power plants put them in various places with the hopes that they'll sit there and never leak or spill or you know come running down the river. Um, the next slide shows us what the result of uh, this, one of these coal ash spills look like. It's a pretty nasty thing. Can you give us some idea of the, the size of the, the problem, the size of the spill that they had in Tennessee? Um, I don't actually know the size. Okay. I, I, I know that it, uh, it poured into the river and, um, and it, it, it actually made its way into the Clinch River, which was rather ironic because um, the Clinch River uh, had a nuclear power plant that was being built on it that was supposed to be the model for how we can eliminate coal. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was shut down <laughs> for political reasons. So, you know, now here we go. It, it kind of came back uh, in a very um, aptly ironic way to bite us. And what were they going to burn in that power plant? That was going to be a, a fast breeder reactor, oh. uh, similar to the ones, uh, not exactly the same, but similar to the one, I, uh, the technology I talk about in my book. Okay. All right, so we've mentioned a lot about global warming, and as you said, there are some people that just don't buy it, but we have proof. Ladies and gentlemen, we have definitive proof of global warming, and that's on our next slide, so let's bring that one up. We can dispel this uh, any sort of doubts and worries about this forever. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> now we've got that. So... I've read your book, of course, and I'm fast-forwarding here to, to what you're talking about. It seems to me, if I've understood it right, that there was a U.S. government program at the Argonne National Laboratory in Idaho and Illinois over the period of about 1964 to 1994. 1984 to 94. 1984 to 1994. And the purpose of this program was to find a way to produce electricity from nuclear power without the risks. 
are right. with minimizing the risks. Right. Well, the, the physicists at Argonne um, started up a fast breeder reactor back in uh, 1964 mm -hmm. called uh, the EBR2, the Experimental Breeder Reactor. And uh, by 1984, they realized that unless they could figure out a way to solve all the problems associated with nuclear power, that it was simply going to be politically untenable to use it. Mm -hmm. And they were convinced that nuclear power was the fuel of the future. So they set out on a project called the Integral Fast Reactor Project back in 1984 to figure out a way to solve all the problems associated with nuclear power. They got an army of physicists up there. They carried out what was probably the biggest energy research project in history. And by 1994, they had succeeded in their goals beyond their wildest imaginations. They were right at the very end of the project when Congress inexplicably pulled their funding, shut down the project, ordered them to dismantle the facility, even though it was the world's foremost nuclear research facility, because it was, quote, a symbol. And mm -hmm. that was from the, the Clinton White House. And then uh, the Department of Energy ordered the, the uh, physicists and engineers who worked on the project to not publicize it. So this technology and the design for this revolutionary reactor that could provide all the energy that we need for the whole planet for almost a thousand years without mining a single speck of uranium has just been sitting on the shelf unknown to the public uh, for the last 15 years. That is just unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I still find it unbelievable, and I've been researching this for a decade. For a decade. So, so just to recap this, the government did all this research, hundreds of scientists or thousands of scientists? Uh, about almost 500 PhDs. 500 uh, PhDs working on this program up in Idaho um, on integral like a charm. fast reactors. They succeeded in, in developing another... Another technology for creating electricity from nuclear power, and then the government said, no, this is done. We're not going to continue the program. We're going to dismantle the reactor. We're taking it apart so it cannot be used for any more research. And Pretend it never happened. And pretend it never happened. Unbelievable. Yeah, and, okay. and very costly to the planet because... Had they continued the research, uh, they would have finished up the project in short order. They were basically mm -hmm. taking a process that they had already used to formulate, to fabricate uh, tens of thousands of fuel pins, and they were going to make a commercial-sized uh, version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only thing that was left to do. Huh. And uh, had they continued the project, we would now be building these reactors, mm -hmm. and we would have a lot less uh, pollution, and we would have a key, essentially, to eliminating coal and ultimately to eliminating all fossil fuels, which is possibly one of the reasons why this was covered up. But, <laughs> but you know, I can't say uh, that there was any kind of conspiracy. There was obviously a lot of ignorance involved, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of political pandering, um, and possibly pressure from the fossil fuel industries, which are, of course, the most powerful industries on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I can't... I, I can't say their their fingerprints aren't on it, but right. uh, they're good at wiping off their fingerprints. Wow! Um, so, uh, a safer way to create electricity from nuclear power. Okay. So one of the things when people think about nuclear power, I think it scares a lot of people, and I agree with you. It's ignorance. I assume we agree on that. Um, but one of the things that people think about is nuclear weapons, and they equate nuclear power with nuclear weapons. But there's, which is pretty far-fetched, but then there are the more real things like nuclear waste, which actually is something that we have from the current type of nuclear power. Um, the next slide shows us some fuel casks that nuclear waste is stored in. Um, I've heard that they were, I mean, for a while the government wanted to build a, a deep underground place in Yucca Mountain, Nevada, to store just thousands of tons of, of high-level, highly radioactive nuclear waste. I don't know where that thing is now. Um, another thing it's in that, trouble. It's in trouble. Good, as it should be, <clears throat> in my opinion. Another thing, the Goshute Indian tribe in uh, Utah, just uh, outside of Salt Lake City, negotiated their own deal with the federal government. Well, it was with a uh, consortium of power companies to temp quote unquote temporarily store some high level nuclear waste on their land. And I don't know where that one went, but a lot of the members of that Indian tribe said, 
the elders who signed the deal on their behalf sold them out. Um, but we have real problems of nuclear waste all around the country. So does this integral fast reactor eliminate that problem of creating lots and lots of highly radioactive uh, nuclear waste with a long half-life? And, no. and tell us about that. Well, it does create nuclear waste, um, as any nuclear plant would, but the type of spent fuel we have now is going to be radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And thus, they're trying to create a, a situation in Yucca Mountain where they can put this stuff and then essentially watch over it for vitam mm -hmm. uh, the, the fast reactor, The fast reactor that I write about in Prescription for the Planet actually burns that nuclear waste as fuel. Mm -hmm. And it it utilizes about 100% of the energy that's available in mined uranium instead of the less than 1% that our reactors do today. So because of that, it, it's so much more efficient. And we have so much spent fuel and so much depleted uranium from creating fuel for the current type of reactors that we have that we would never have to mine any uranium. And we would just use it all up. Now, you will get nuclear waste out of it, but it won't be anything that can be used for weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, all the uranium and plutonium that's in spent fuel today will be completely consumed, and you'll get highly radioactive fission products that have to be disposed of when a plant shuts down after about 50 or 60 years. Um, it will be in a form uh, that's embedded in glass, and nothing can leach out of this glass for thousands of years. Well, that sounds pretty good, uh, and it sounds even better when you realize that the, the radioactive materials that are in that glass will only be radioactive for a few hundred years. So long before any of it could leach into the environment, it won't be radioactive anymore because they have much shorter half-lives. So mm -hmm. essentially, you would be able to dispose of this safely in any number of places, even Yucca Mountain if you wanted to. <laughs> and, uh, and the problem would essentially be solved. By the way, it can also burn all the material from decommissioned nuclear weapons. Hmm. So essentially, we're taking a, 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 a something that we really want to get rid of, that we're desperate to get rid of, and we're making it... Uh, making our energy out of it and completely solving the problem. So it's like taking waste and making electricity out of it. Exactly. Um, so the, the nuclear, the type of tech, nuclear power technology that we have right now uses about 1% of the energy that's in there. A little less. Okay. And the integral fast reactor would use about 100%. We would use all of it. <clears throat> we would use all of it. All right. Um, I want to ask you, <coughs> excuse me. So um, we would not have to mine for uranium. Wouldn't have to mine uranium. Wouldn't have to enrich uranium either. Uh huh. And and one of the arguments that uh, a lot of anti-nuclear people have against using nuclear power is the carbon footprint and and the pollution involved with mining and enriching uranium. Mm -hmm. Problem solved. We aren't going to have to do that anymore. I wanted to mention that Tom's book is available from Amazon.com and also available on. The avid, the avid reader. avid reader here in Davis. So come on by and pick one yeah. up. Also, also um, the first part of the book, uh, you can read it online at my website, prescriptionfortheplanet.com. Prescriptionfortheplanet.com. So since the book was published in the fall, a lot of people around the world, well, you talked to lots of scientists, nuclear physicists, and so on, including the men that, that ran this program up there from 1984 until 1994, and they proofread your book, right? Well, I published. worked very closely with them. I still do, actually. Okay. And so the, since the book was published, a lot of scientists have found the book, read it, gotten excited about it, and then gotten in touch with you. Um, tell me about that process. Well, it's happened on a level and at a speed which still boggles my mind. Every day, new things are coming up. Uh, in the book, I propose a, a global nonprofit energy consortium that would maintain, would supervise the building of nuclear plants, would manage nuclear plants, would essentially take control of the entire fuel cycle so that it would never be in the hands of private corporations. It might be tempted to cut corners, uh, to not train their employees well. Um, 
the idea was that we want to reduce the proliferation and accident risks to the ex to the smallest degree possible. Even though the reactor itself is so safe that it will shut itself down with with uh, worst case scenarios where they don't have loss of uh, heat sink or loss of flow and all the operators are dead, thing will just shut itself down just because of the physics of the materials. But you want to have uh, international control over fissile material, no matter what kind of reactors you use, just to keep it, for, even to keep people from getting a hold of it for dirty bombs or whatever. Um, some people saw this as politically naive to think that we could get all the nations of the world to cooperate, even if it meant unlimited energy for every nation. Um, and one of the people who didn't think it was politically naive at all is the person who's managed Russia's nuclear program for since Gorbachev, who uh, really wanted to take this and run with it. So we formed uh, an international uh, NGO called the uh, Science Council for Global Initiatives. And um, we've been uh, getting some of the top people in India, Russia, the United States, France, we're bringing in China, South Korea, uh, to actually create this global energy consortium and try to make uh, the vision of prescription for the planet a reality in less than six months. It's, my head is spinning. So it, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening as we speak. Um, one, uh, kind of influential uh, person when it comes to global warming that I know has picked up your book and liked it is Jim Hansen, which is our next slide. So if we could put Jim Hansen up there. You want to tell me a little bit about your conversations with Jim Hansen about the global energy revolution? Well, uh, Jim is uh, probably the most widely known and respected climatologist in the world. Um, he became somewhat of a celebrity when the Bush administration tried to shut him up when he started talking about how serious global warming is. Uh, Jim is the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies and so it was difficult for the Bush administration to kind of just shuffle him under the rug and he wasn't about to stop uh, talking about it just because they were putting the elbow to him. So. Um, He's uh, he's Al Gore. He was Al Gore's main science advisor uh, in in the run up to the creation of the inconvenient an inconvenient truth, uh, Gore's famous film, and um, and he he wants to build uh, an integral fast reactor. He said even if even if renewable energy can supply everything we need, this would be a cheap insurance policy, mm -hmm. so that um, so that we could uh, have it available just in case we find five or ten years down the road that it can't produce everything we need. Okay, now I understand the appeal of renewable energy like solar energy and wind energy. I mean, the sun, is, sun shines as long as it's <clears throat> well, as long as it's daytime and sunny out, and the wind often blows. It blows really strong in some places. Actually, uh, at two o'clock in the morning is when it blows hardest. It blows hardest at two in the morning. When you need the energy less. Right, well, that's true. Um, and I remember reading in one of the articles that if you add up solar and wind energy, that they provide a total of about 2% of the U.S. energy demand right now. Um, I would imagine the figure worldwide is probably less. It's yeah, around 1% to 2%. Yeah. So if people say, well, skip the fast re or integral fast reactor, why don't we just use solar and wind? They, they need to, well, what would you say? What would you say? Well, I would say that solar and wind are great, but uh, you, you can't build something in a laboratory or on a small scale and just expect that it, you can scale it up to any scale whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, Scientific American did a, an, a, a special edition on solar power, and they, they came to the conclusion that in order to provide 69% of the electricity that the United States needs, uh, we'd have to build 30,000 square miles of solar panels. Now, that's just 69%. Mm -hmm. 30,000 square miles of solar panels. I don't know if you can imagine what a square mile consists of, a, mile, a square that's a mile on each side. You'd mm -hmm. have to cover completely cover two of those every day, seven days a week, until the middle of the century to reach that point, at, mm -hmm. which, at which point you'd only have two-thirds of the ener energy you need anyway. It seems like we ought to find a better way. There are many better ways. You know, it would be great. Uh, whatever wind and solar can bring to the table is fine, but mm -hmm. they, they have their problems with intermittency, and it makes it very, very difficult for utility companies to maintain 
uh, stability in the grid because uh, they're coming and going whenever they please. Um, nuclear power, on the other hand, provides base load power 24-7, and it can be relied on, and it can follow the load. So, uh, you know, when solar is, solar is producing during the day, when, wind, when the wind is blowing, the nuclear plants can either throttle back or, better yet, be used for something else more productive like uh, desalination, for instance, which we're going to need a lot of considering that we're already short of water in many places in the world. Mm -hmm. um, there are two colliding realities. One is the demographics uh, indicate that we'll have 9 to 10 billion people by the middle of the century, about 50% more than we have now. Meanwhile, the glaciers on which billions of people depend for water from the Himalayas and the Andes are melting. They're mm -hmm. retreating. So water supplies are getting tighter, populations are getting larger. The only place we can get water is desalination wow. and massive desalination, and that takes a lot of energy. Well, if we build integral fast reactors and build dual desalination electricity production, we can do it. There's plenty of fuel, and it's free. It sounds like a, a fabulous plan. So what can people do? For your viewers out here that are watching and they say, I know enough to know that I'm basically interested in it. I think this is a plan that, that the, the government should try and put into place, or how can we make this a reality? Well, people have actually come up to me and said, I want to offer my land as a place to build an integral fast reactor. Really? <laughs> this is somebody that really wants to get out there and do something. I know it's, it's frustrating for somebody who wants to take action to look at something that's basically a, a mega policy decision that has to be made. I mean, these, these are decisions that have to be, be made on the very highest level of national and international governing. Um, I think what people can do, aside from the logical things like putting in compact fluorescent light bulbs instead of incandescents and that sort of thing, uh, is educate themselves mm -hmm. and educate their friends and create a situation where our politicians are going to be pressured, are going to be forced by public pressure to make the decisions that have to be made. Because you know that the lobbyists for the coal and the oil industries and all all the status quo industries that are going to be threatened by a, a global energy revolution are going to be putting all kinds of pressure on the politicians. And unfortunately, the way our system works with campaign finance being done on a large part by corporations, um, it's going to take a lot of pressure. It is. Thank you, Tom. One last mention, prescription for the planet. You can get it from Amazon.com or the Avid Reader here in Davis. This has been On the Wire. My name is Mark Graham, and this has been Tom Bleese. Good night. Thanks. Wow, that went fast. Yeah, it did, didn't it? We got to the 10-minute mark. And <laughs>